So I'm really excited to introduce you to Ian Baker, who's an anthropologist and uh, he's an amazing writer. And we're going to talk about some of the deeper aspects of Tantra and his new book, uh, Tibetan Yoga. Uh, I was kind of excited when I was reading your book going, oh my God, this is like deep stuff. And for you guys who are listening, I want you to know this isn't the usual talk on uh, yoga and tantra and all the surface stuff that we kind of hear out there this is like the deeper aspect of it so thanks for joining me and uh, and you're going to educate us all on this stuff because it's 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 <laughs> this is what i'm going to say about you <laughs> when i was reading your book and i was connecting with it i was like um he and and your other books of course i was reading you wrote the the secret temple of the dalai lama for example and Tibetan art of healing. And I thought, he's like the secret agent of spirituality. <laughs> <laughs> he knows all the secrets. <laughs> so so uh, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, absolutely. Yeah. So you're talking to us from Thailand. Uh, our connection is good now, but who knows what will happen. But uh, hopefully it will all go well. So tell, tell us a little bit about your life because you're traveling, you're going places. Uh, I've got a photo of you in the Himalayas. Um, you, you seem to be all over the occult uh, and the mysterious that's out there. Is that, is that yeah. the right description of it? I, I'd say it's a fair description. I, I had the opportunity, I guess it all began when I went to, to Kathmandu, to Nepal, when I was 19 years old on a college semester abroad program. So I had a sort of, you could say a pseudo academic uh, entree into the Himalayan world, but it changed my life in the sense that uh, I arrived in Nepal at that time, which was back in the, in the 1970s. And mm. I just felt that I'd found my, my home. Mm. And so I worked out my life after finishing college. I went on to a master's degree uh, at, at Oxford University. But I ended up living in Nepal for, for many years, uh, working there, but also very much uh, my main purpose was delving deeply into the mysteries of, as you said, yoga, tantra, and meditation. Mm. And uh, that really was um, you know, a wonderful uh, nexus or a crucible, really, from which to mm. explore all these things very, very experientially with great masters. And um, subsequent to that, my books and film projects and other work have all kind of grown out of that in this initial, you could say, initiation into the magic of the Cavendish Valley in the 1970s. Mm. Yeah, when I when I was reading uh, your new book, uh, Tibetan Yoga, when I'm looking at the illustrations and I'm looking at the descriptions and I'm seeing the kind of people you're talking to, um, there's a lot of mystery about it because you know, Tantra isn't something you can just say, okay, Tantra is this. Uh, I know we try to put it in a box, but it's many different things. And I love the way that all the descriptions uh, and the illustrations are really showing uh, the reader how deep this is. And then behind it all, it, there's not just mystery, there's so many secret stuff going on that, that uh, you really have to commit to learning before it uh, reveals itself. Yes, I would say that's, that's absolutely fair. I mean, there's only so much, obviously, that in a way can be conveyed in the book, but in a certain sense, this particular one, Tibetan yoga was very long in the making. And as you probably saw, the photographs that I used in it go back over a course of decades. So some of those are from my early periods in, in, in Nepal, but they also, a lot of them are from my more recent work that I've been doing in Bhutan, uh, mm. as they I found the you know between Tibet, Bhutan, and Nepal, Bhutan is an extraordinary place where the living tradition, you could say, of, of tantric Buddhism, uh, mm. is, is very very current, and so a lot of my research is there, and a lot of the photographs of contemporary yogis and yoginis are, mm. are from the. Himalayan world of uh, kingdom of, of Bhutan, the last, yeah. the last remaining. Yeah, what is it like up there? Because it's so, Bhutan seems so secretive in many different ways. It's, it's nestled in, <laughs> in this little corner. 
And it is. I mean, it's an extraordinary. I literally just came back from there a week ago. I was just there for two weeks. So I'm just here sort of on a writing retreat in, in Thailand. But my uh, I spend a lot of time in Bhutan these year, uh, these days or these years. And um, it's it's a sequestered little Himalayan kingdom, uh, the last remaining. As I'm sure you and other viewers are aware, it has retained uh, an unbroken tradition of Tibetan uh, Buddhism, Tantric Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And in fact, some of its earlier traditions go back even before some of the earliest, earliest lineages in Tibet. So it's an extraordinary uh, place. And also Bhutan, with less than a million people, has been extremely progressive. The government is supporting very much this idea that Tantric Buddhism is the state religion, as it were. Um, mm -hmm. And so they're looking very much at ways of trying to um, make these ancient teachings relevant to a contemporary uh, generation uh, mm -hmm. so that they will not be just seen as a kind of colorful anachronism mm -hmm. uh, and aesthetics, but actually something that can deeply uh, transform our lives. Mm -hmm. And Khan is really taking a uh, critical role in that particular dialogue. Beautiful. Yeah, we need that. We need it as the world is becoming so material. <laughs> exactly. And this is where Bhutan really has an incredibly special role to play, even, you know, despite it being, you know, as I said, less, it's only about 800,000 people living in Bhutan. But it is taking this leading role in a kind of, hopefully, kind of post-materialistic uh, view of what modernity and what post-modernity can actually mean. And so this is something I'm very excited about. And also the book, Tibetan Yoga, it's, I should also clarify that it's some ways a, a misnomer uh, to call it Tibetan Yoga, because we're really talking about uh, the essence of the yogic uh, contemplative and meditative practices of the whole Himalayan region. Mm. Um, and so in a way it relates as much to Bhutan as it does to, uh, as to Tibet, uh, but a lot of the, you know, the Tibetan, the, the Buddhist lineages in Bhutan all originally came from uh, from the north, from from Tibet, and that's mm. their name it has. But I also wanted to clarify um, that, um, you know, even more profoundly, I think, when we look at, you, know, you bring up some of the misconceptions that people have, tend to have about mm. Tantra and yoga generally, um, but these traditions, as we know, are so deeply interwoven. And so there's a lot of dialect material. There's a lot of, uh, I mean, I've, I've been was deeply immersed in the Tibetan Buddhist world in Nepal for, for decades, but mm. I was also initiated into Shaivite Tantra, Kaula, Marg, mm. particularly in Assam and mm. in South India. And what for me is fascinating is to see that the core practices uh, at, at the depth, you could say sort of at the secret level of these traditions, mm. all sort of common methodology. And mm. that's what I book and certainly in, in subsequent writings, this is where my own attention is going as to, you know, what is the core essence that sort of connects these different traditions. Mm. How's your practice changed as you sort of delve deeper and you because uh, you, you you're like an archaeologist of uh, the the yoga and tantra world, you know, you 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 keep discovering more, uh, and we and my wife and I teach a lot about the importance of daily spiritual practice, the sadhana. So yes. is it really affecting your practice in sadhana, going deeper into all this? Very much it has. I mean, as uh, it's not really you know, the book is written very much from a kind of objective perspective in other words it's not a personal narrative mm -hmm. some of that comes out of, i don't know there's another book that i wrote called the heart of the world a journey to tibet's lost paradise which is essentially a memoir that i wrote about uh, 15 years ago that mm -hmm. uh, actually does sort of map out my own sort of spiritual uh, personal spiritual journey and the initiations and long retreats that i undertook in the Him in caves in the himalayas through my teacher who just passed away a few years ago at 102. Mm. Um, but um, so I went very, very deeply into the essence, you could say the core of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, uh, mm. particularly and 
very specifically, and it's yogic iteration rather than a monastic mm. form, which I could find relevant to my life or really to where life is going in the 21st century. So this was really my objective and what this book in a certain sense about is about is my uh, wanting to go beneath the, the veils, if you will, of the monastic tradition of Tibetan mm -hmm. Buddhism, find out what are the kind of core yogic practices and secrets, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. that underlie it. And that's, I was very much an experiential journey for me. And so this book and the earlier one you mentioned, The Dalai Lama's Secret Temple, was really about going into these practices firsthand. And certainly, uh, as a result of that, my own daily practice, um, which I just finished shortly before our <laughs> conversation, uh, you know, is, is like everything in life, an organic and unfolding process. And I think um, it has changed me over the years. And it's also uh, partly because I am both initiated within the Tibetan Buddhist tradition as well as within the Shaivite uh, tradition. Mm -hmm in India and have teachers that I deeply respect from both traditions and what I find remarkable in both of those, as was Chatra and Bashe, deep respect for the Shaivite, the technologies, the yogic technologies of the Shaiva tradition. Um, so my practice in a certain sense is, 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 you could say, slightly syncretic in that I draw these, uh, uh, I include elements of both of these practices, but mm -hmm. as I said, in my experience and my view, the, um, the core ways in which we work with the body, the breath, and the mind are essentially shared to a large degree in common between the two traditions, as mm -hmm. well as with other esoteric uh, ways in which we try to transform our way of relating to the world uh, into something. Yeah, yeah. No, your book is, it goes... Everything pretty deep into what the practices are. You have, um, the, uh, I saw the yoginis and the yogis there uh, who were practicing. I connected with some of the practices that they were doing. Um, but what, um, what is the difference, let's say, uh, or, uh, than the, the yoga of the Tibetan yoga than say, uh, something that somebody's practicing in the West as yoga, let's say. Yeah. Okay. Well, yoga in particular, uh, if we look at it in the Tibetan translation of the word, uh, which means essentially to be uh, both a state and a practice that brings us into our own natural mm -hmm. condition, which would mean in, a, in, in this sense, the pure nature of the body, breath and mind, the body, the energy and the mind. So yoga in the same way that it refers to that in the Indic traditions is, is both a method and a, a state of unification. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's very specific about the, um, the Tibetan practices is that the, what we tend to think of in the West is, is practices of asana, uh, physical, the physical mm -hmm. component of the yogic practices, which we are, which we know increasingly were to some degree, uh, innovations of the early 20th century uh, in India's own encounter with the West and what's now called modern postural yoga, mm -hmm. being something that's again evolving through a kind of cross-cultural dialogue, but obviously with very strong uh, roots in physical practices in mm -hmm. India before that. So these uh, that physical aspect of the Tibetan tradition is just the foundation for a set of uh, of six, in a sense that this is what Tibet, the, the book Tibetan Yoga is, is trying to explicate, six very specific practices that um, are based upon the kind of energetic anatomy of the body, the subtle anatomy of the body, which these physical practices are, are structured and designed to, to open up this, uh, to shift us from our kind of persona, as it were, to our essence. And um, this is, I think, something that is, to some degree, has yet not yet um, been fully incorporated into yoga in the West. So we're here talking about ways in which we actively engage the imagination, uh, imaginative functions of the mind, the way we work with um, uh, very powerful pranayama practices with the breath, the way we work with visualization, but more specifically, the way we work with energy. Uh, and that's really where the Tibetan yoga's 
come into play. They're called the completion stage yogas, uh, as opposed to the, say, foundational creation phase. Mm. So it's these completion phases that involve the the more esoteric um, uh, practices that my book is is um, revealing to some degree, even though they're traditionally kept secret. But these involve, you know, the more controversial aspects of dual cultivation between uh, tantric consorts, uh, the ways that's used to actually um, to enhance the the yogas of inner fire that are used with very dynamic breathing pr practices, as opposed to just breath observation. That, of course, as we know from the modern mindfulness movement, was essentially a derivation of a of a monastic practice as opposed mm. to a yogic practice. Mm. What I try to really emphasize in the book is that these things, although they're, they're not just esoteric sort of Tibetan secrets, as it were, but they're things that deeply engage us as, uh, as beings who are living on multiple dimensions, uh, engaged with the world rather than uh, renouncing the world and retiring from it, which is more the monastic model. Mm. So what I hope this book is doing is to kind of bring about a kind of, you could say, po uh, a, uh, to reveal the the essence of Tibetan Buddhism, as it were, outside of its monastic uh, purview, uh, which mm. is things which is envisioned. And I would also just mention too that I'll be, this book will be followed up. Um, this one is called Tibetan Yoga Practices and Principles, and in a certain sense, it's like a teaser, in the sense that it's revealing a whole range of ways in which we can engage the mind during states of waking, dreaming, sleeping, even dying. But this will be followed up by another book, more or less on the same format, called Methods and Techniques, that will go much deeper into the actual practices, and particularly how these practices have been evolving over time, and how they turn uh, through the dialogue with modern science can be even re-envisioned today as uh, practices that can, can really bring about the kind of collective transformation that mm. the, the world and the earth so, so urgently requires. Yes, yeah. Would you say your books that you write are particularly for the deep seeker um, than the uh, sort of flyby yoga <laughs> aficionado? <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say. I mean, in a certain sense, the books are all simply... Um, it's funny, none of the books that I've written are books that I've actually intended to write initially. They actually all were books that sort of came out of my own experience. They were ways of deepening my own seat, uh, path. And um, I found that in writing the books, it was a way of gaining even a deeper perspective on the practices that I was actually doing and on the practices that I was learning about and trying to put them into to a, a, deep, a deeper framework. So they are, in that sense, uh, definitely geared towards uh, those individuals who want to sort of take their own spiritual practice to, to, to the deepest possible level. Um, yeah. And uh, at the same time, I, I try to make them, in a way, accessible. Uh, so it, it doesn't mean things, just because things are esoteric doesn't mean have to mean that they're, they are um, inaccessible. And mm -hmm. I think that it's something that uh, probably comes through in, uh, in this book, Tibetan mm. Yoga, that uh, uh, as you know, in the Indi Indian tradition, a lot of the tantras are written in what was called twilight language, a kind mm. of symbolic script that was meant to be specific, you know, very arcane and inaccessible to the general reader so that the inner practices would remain hidden. But part of what this book is about is a kind of decoding, if you will, of that mm. twilight language make these practices uh, uh, show their direct relevancy to our everyday lives. Sure, yeah. No, I got that. When I started reading it, I see it's got partly your experience, but also your experience goes for many, many years. So the, the, the practitioner who wants to follow needs to, you know, I, I say the same thing. You've got to be dedicated to get the best thing out of something. It's not, uh, you can't just be like, well, I'll do it one day and not do it for three days. And um, and I like this and I picked up on this uh, book because we teach the same thing. It, it's not, you know, we, we, we live in a world where authentic is sort of the word buzzword these days and 
people want to live their highest potential and all these kind of things that were said, but not understanding maybe the, the commitment it takes. Uh, the rewards are amazing. The rewards are great, but the commitment it takes is worth it. Um, it's not something that you should see that takes hours to do and you just don't have the time. It's, it's something that you can do and people like you are writing, you know, uh, in an accessible way, but you're also giving such deep, um, traditional things that are usually not written about. Um, I know in the practices that we do with our guru, to say, um, you know, sure, uh, go and do it. And then uh, don't worry about the rest. Just, just practice and, and the rest will be revealed as, as necessary and in its own time. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I love that about your book. And, and in the book you write about meditating on the elements uh, or meditating with the elements. Uh, tell us a little bit about that because I think that's something very accessible to do. Yes. Now, this is something I did want to bring out. It's traditionally been thought of as a secret practice within Tibetan Buddhism, although its roots are very clearly in the earliest of the um, Buddhist um, Pali Canon, which is this idea of meditating on these um, elemental processes of, that we tend to sort of uh, configure as earth, water, fire, air, and space, but these are, in a sense, represented, representing uh, processes within our own body minds of fluidity of fire of metabolism and um, and they're also practices that can be done very specifically with the support of, of the natural elements of the uh, of the world so for example with sunlight with uh, with earth with, with stone with, with the flow of water at a waterfall for example so I wanted very much to, to bring out this element, even though, again, these are considered secret practices, but in a very simple way. For example, there's an image in the book of a yogini in Bhutan uh, who's done a three-year retreat who just goes down into what would be called a child pose in modern postural yoga at the top, at the, beneath the waterfall and merges her mind with the sound of the flowing water coming over the rocks. And this is considered a very powerful technique Hmm. We're going beyond mind as its usual sort of uh, process of thoughts and emotions, but dissolving those into the pure awareness that is, in a sense, the gateway into the deeper levels of yoga. Uh, and as you say, these are practices that can be done anywhere. Uh, hmm. As long as we have, we tune into those sounds, as it were, of the natural world. Hmm. Is it because the Nate, uh, we're made of the five elements, the Panchabhuta, that we are connecting? Is that what we're doing? It's very much the idea that the same kind of uh, Panchabhuta uh, gunas that are part of our own makeup, the earth, water, fire, and air, that we see symbolized, for example, in a, in a Buddhist stupa, which is essentially representing our own psychophysical aggregates. Hmm. Those are obviously mirrored and reflected and, uh, in a sense, inseparable from the the psychophysical aggregates of the natural world if we see the universe as something conscious. Uh, and so these are practices in which that uh, perceived boundary, which is actually completely artificial between the, ele the outer elements of the natural world and the, of the elements within our own body-mind, mm. are, are are, techniques are used in which to dissolve that boundary and then the actual boundaries of our body and minds become mm -hmm. something that we recognize as illusory and that we are deeply interwoven and interconnected with the fabric of the universe. And that, of course, is, you know, the very etymology of the word Tantra itself, which is this wonderful weaving of uh, the interweaving, uh, uh, one of the uh, many ways in which Tantra is described is this sort of this warp and woof of of, mm -hmm. of reality and this, this mm -hmm. uh, the interweaving mm -hmm. and that's i think something that that practice of working with the elements is is, is very uh, mm -hmm. weird for. um in your book uh, the secret temple of dalai lama i haven't read that what is that about so that's uh the secret temple of dalai lama is about a 17th century uh temple uh in lhasa behind the 
Dalai Lama's Potala Palace uh, that was uh, built as a mandala and the top floor of which was a private meditation chamber for the Dalai Lamas from the period of the sixth Dalai Lama at the end of the 17th century up until the current Dalai Lama who had to leave to that unfortunately before he was able to visit that uh, temple mm -hmm. it's, it itself. But the top floor has these extraordinary set of murals which are essentially an illustrated guide uh, of the path to enlightenment as uh, according to the most esoteric and secret practices mm. of Tibet Buddhism. And so that book, uh, I was able to photograph um, those years ago together with uh, another, another friend, Thomas Laird. And we created a book um, based upon uh, those murals after the Dalai Lama said, I had actually originally gave a set of my own photographs of the, the temple to His Holiness in Dharamsala. Uh, and he was so ecstatic about them because he said, I had to leave Tibet before I could see these. And now I'm seeing them for the first time. So he said, please make a book about them. Wow. And I said, Your Holiness, isn't, aren't these secret practices? And he very specifically said, the time of secrecy is over. <laughs> these practices need to be shared especially he said with the western world because then he, he very jokingly said look at all these figures on the that are that are uh, painted he said these don't even look like the Tibetans; they're bearded like you are and hairy and <laughs> so it was a wonderful kind of uh and that really is what set me off on that journey of, of you could say uh the of the secret practices and uh the holiness wrote introductions and forwards to my subsequent books uh but very much I think something that he's deeply dedicated to, which is to to it's partly coming out in his the, the dialogue between science and uh, meditation that he's been very much um, at the forefront of. Um, but it's just trying to to show the, the the powerful and contemporary relevance of practices that are otherwise easy just to kind of consign to something in the past. Mm. And I think really what what we're all working towards is to show through dedication, as you say, and commitment, uh, how we can transform the human condition. Mm. What, was, what was the energy like in that temple? <laughs> the energy in that temple was wonderful, incredibly charged, and, uh, but even more so, the, the opportunity to actually to, to take these photographs and then sit with His Holiness over the course of a week. This is back before when he was much more accessible, it was before the Nobel Prize and all of that, and just to have him go through each image in turn. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of his own direct commentary on some of these very unusual images um, are, are, are directly transcribed into the book. So in a certain sense, the book very much has his, his, his presence within it. And mm -hmm. that, that, oh, was the dark, that atmosphere that sort of brought these ancient, you could say not ancient, but these very, very extraordinary, uh, works of art uh, into uh, into dialogue with the, the contemporary world. Oh, yeah, I'm sure he was very happy to see those bringing, bringing to life something he, he missed, which was so uh, uh, something he really wanted to see. I'm going to look out for it as well. I'm going to get the book and go through it. Thanks. But mm -hmm. I could talk to you for hours and hours about this stuff, but I really want everybody to, you know, if you're a serious practitioner, you really want to get into this more, much more. Tibetan Yoga is the book. There's a sequel coming out and the Dalai Lama Secret Temple as well. So, uh, and look up uh, Ian Baker uh, on, you have a website? I do. Right now it actually needs to, it's being reworked. So there is a, a www.ianbaker.com. It goes right now onto ianbakerjourneys.com, but that will be re resurrected in the next week or so. It's just going through a, a, a like I said, you're a mystery. In <laughs> <laughs> Even finding you is a mystery. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for talking to me and uh, enlightening us all on your journeys and, uh, and I'm sure everybody who's reading, I'm going to read your book, is going to find it amazing. So, lots of love. Thank to you, Cameron. It's been a been a great pleasure, and uh, we'll speak you know, soon. Very good. Thanks no. again. Namaste.